Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Clean Capitalist Leadership Council annual meeting. My name is Elizabeth Halliday and we're honored and grateful that you've chosen to spend your time with us today, especially in light of all the exciting events happening in New York City for Climate Week 2019. With demonstrators around the world calling for bold action on energy and the environment, clearly the will of the people is known. This groundswell can provide the political cover that many elected officials need to bring about change. But demanding action is easy and implementing solutions is hard. Now that many clean and renewable technologies are cost competitive with legacy energy providers, what will be the regulatory environment they face? What will happen to oil and gas? Taxes? Tariffs? Will a breakthrough technology be bogged down with five years of red tape, or will it have the governmental support to allow it to flourish? Pollution and global warming is worldwide, yet energy markets are often a hodgepodge of systems that don't always work together. What do we do now? These are complex issues that we seek to address. But here at the Clean Capitalist Leadership Council and our own growing coalition of researchers in finance, tax policy, science, efficiency, innovation, energy choice, all in the realm of public policy, we are up to the task. Our co-host today, conservative philanthropist Andy Sabin and Conserve America, Trammell S. Crow, founder of EarthX and his policy team peppered throughout the room, Rod Richardson, of the Grace Richardson Fund came together to forge this partnership and create a forum to discuss new policy ideas that protect the environment and adhere to traditional free market and conservative values. They recognize that philanthropists and research foundations play a powerful role in finding policy solutions that bring about fundamental change. They're joined in this effort by other groups in the public policy space with us as part of the Clean Capitalist Coalition Charles Hernick of Crest Forum will speak about that a bit later, and co-host Jeremy Harrell of ClearPath will speak in greater detail about potential solutions in innovation. Other coalition members, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, the American Renewable Energy Institute, they're in the house, and we're thankful for all of them for showing up and sharing the news of their activities with all of you. These coalition members who are not here are out engaging at their own meetings, just like this, across the nation. And we invite all of you to join us and support us as we transform our world together. Certainly with the Sustainable Development Goals, if any of our policies were enacted, we would easily uh, tick off number seven, number eight, and number nine. But by virtue of all of us being here, we clearly exemplify goal number 17, partnerships. I'd like to thank everyone at the Climate Group and National Clean Energy Week for including us in their roster of programming, Club 101, Indigo Productions, and my own team of helpers for their superb assistance this afternoon. I'll be back in here and return throughout the meeting. To begin our program, a discussion of clean tax cuts and clean free market policies, please welcome from Washington, D.C., Charles Hernick, Director of Policy at Crest Forum, Pasha Majdi, Federal Policy Manager at ACEEE, and Wayne Weingarten, Senior Fellow at the Pacific Research Institute, and of course, the driving force behind the Clean Capitalist Leadership Council, President of the Grace Richardson Fund, Rod Richardson. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much all for coming to, to hear about what new policy ideas we have been uh, instigating and innovating and developing and moving forward with. Uh, I want to thank all of my uh, co-hosts, uh, Trammell Crow with EarthX and Andy Sabin and uh, Charles from uh, uh, Crest Forum, Jeremy Harrell from ClearPath. This has all been a, a uh, collaborative effort from the get-go. What we're going to be talking about today is clean free market policies. At one point at a meeting last year, a, a, different, a bunch of different policy groups got together and we realized that we were all working on different aspects of the same problem. We were trying to find ways to reduce the barriers to clean solutions. And essentially this is a very laissez-faire approach where instead of trying to raise barriers or regulate or create bigger government, you're trying to just simply empower clean solutions with greater freedom. For the Grace Richardson Fund, the program was launched in 2016 at uh, our day uh, when we publicly announced the idea that, hey, look, 
clean technologies have just tipped uh, from uh, being more expensive than fossil fuels to less expensive by the measure of LCOE, levelized cost of electricity. This tipping point has just happened, which means that there are growing profits, uh, reducing costs, and with that uh, shift, uh, it is possible to now consider a new range of free market policies that are based on competition, on removing these barriers. Particularly, we started out with the idea, hey, you can now s use Reaganomics. You can use supply-side tax cuts. You don't have to use straight-up subsidies, uh, you know, the typical kind of tax credits where you're essentially robbing Peter to pay Paul. What you can do is uh, let Paul keep more of his hard-earned money from a profitable venture. Uh, which is a different paradigm, which is much more friendly to uh, conservatives and free market thinkers and libertarians. So in any event, uh, we were helped on that path by many different uh, policy institutes who answered our call and said to, to this idea that, hey, there's a new area of policy that we can research. There's a new set of solutions that we can look at. Uh, Rocky Mountain Institute was very helpful to us in suggesting that we pursue a charrette process, which is a process of collaborative working groups of experts getting together uh, across the board, left and right experts from all around a problem to look at this. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, to start off, uh, let me just say that some of those ideas that we were talking about, about why clean tax cuts would be appealing, these were a priori reasoning that had not really been vetted by you know, uh, uh, scholars at that point, but uh, that scholarly effort is uh, underway, and uh, we'll, you'll be hearing later from Michael Mealing at MIT about a scholarly research conference uh, which will be held at MIT into uh, clean free market policy and clean tax cuts, but one of the first papers for that conference has already been written, and it's been written by Wayne Weingarten uh, from the Pacific Research Institute. Uh, Pacific Research Institute is, is uh, uh, well regarded as one of the leading free market think tanks in the country. They're uh, California based. Um, and uh, Wayne is a very significant person to write this paper on clean tax cuts, uh, comparing it to the carbon tax and to, uh, you know, traditional subsidies because he wrote another paper several years ago with Arthur Laffer. Uh, you know, and that, that paper has played a big role in the consensus among economists that, uh, the current consensus at least, that the best way to tackle climate change is with a carbon tax. Well, the paper that Wayne wrote with Arthur Laffer, the author of the Laffer Curve, you know, said, well, you know, it's not a bad trade-off if you have a carbon tax and, you know, if you trade that off with elimination of income tax, well, a consumption tax is less distortionary than, an in, uh, than income taxes, so that makes sense. We can endorse that. And that became a major plank, even if the author of the Laffer Curve says carbon tax makes sense, that helped that consensus form. But now we have Wayne to shed some light on whether there's a new instrument that might make sense. So, Wayne, why don't you tell us a little bit about your paper and what your central conclusions are? Thanks so much for, for having me here. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I think the premise for that first paper that Rod was referring to, which I, I think is the right premise for, you know, regardless of left, right, center, where you are, and that is the one thing we know for sure is that if we emit fewer emissions, that's a good thing. Right? I mean, in and of itself, fewer emissions is not a, a, a bad thing. And so the question then is, what are the trade-offs? I mean, economists, we, we focus on those, the trade-offs and incentives. That's kind of our, our, our central kind of tools that we use to, to analyze these issues. And so what the paper that Rob was referring to, what we, uh, Arthur and I had looked at is, if you had a carbon tax and dollar for dollar, replace that with marginal income tax rate reductions, the carbon tax creates a negative incentive. Right? It re increases the price of emissions, so you now want to emit less. That has an economic consequence. The marginal tax rate reductions, though, that creates positive incentives for work, saving, investing. Th those offset one another, and so you have a policy that can address uh, the, the issues with global climate change, but you also have a policy that's offsetting the economic consequences. Now, what Rod had uh, brought to our attention, and I thought it was really fascinating, and I won't say that it might be better, but it might be better, 
<laughs> and, and, and that is, really, it's really looking at the problem as, as in a different question. Really, from, from the beginning, with all externalities, and that's how we economists like to talk about greenhouse gases or uh, sulfur dioxide, all, all, all these emissions, those externalities are not priced into the transaction. And when you talk about cap and trade, you talk about carbon taxes, all we're talking about is how do we get those costs priced into the transaction so every time I use electricity, every time I fill up my car my gas, I'm accounting for uh, th those costs. I'm accounting for the impact of the emissions. Now, there's a few things I have that are uh, concerns with that just in terms of, well, how do we know that the actual economically right cost of emissions is actually equal to the amount of ish, uh, emission reductions that we want to see uh, in terms of what's right for, uh, for the planet. And that's where I think Rod's uh, concept could actually be uh, superior. And the way he's framing the question, I'm not sure he realized it, but I'm going to give him credit for it, is he framed it as, as opposed to talking about it as externalities, how do we incent greater technology, right? Right now, you incent technology by increasing the price of, of, of carbon dioxide emissions. So, you know, gas is more expensive. If gas is more expensive, solar becomes more competitive. It's an indirect kind of connection. Well, what if we went directly to those alternative technologies and we said through the tax code, you can either do it through debt instrument, right, and say you have tax-free debt, just like a municipal bond, or you could do it through the income tax code where you say uh, any profits – you know, and it can get very complicated. All you know, anything. Once you touch the U.S. tax code, it gets very complicated very quickly. But it, you can say no income taxes on income earned on specified technologies that hit specified emission targets, and all of those need to be defined. But if, let's just keep it simple and say zero emissions, zero income taxes. Right? If you do that, what you end up doing is, and this is part of what we did in the paper, depending upon the assumptions, about a 15 percent reduction in the cost of capital for the green uh, field. Uh, that's, that's a really significant reduction in the costs of, of, of creating this technology. And the whole idea is now instead of using negative incentives to try to get the externalities priced into the product, now what we've done is we've said, okay, we're going to reduce, we're going to increase the incentive for people to develop alternative technologies that will have zero emissions, and we're going to just kind of almost skirt the whole externality issue. And so I think that, to me, was one of the most kind of important kind of uh, economic processes that we're changing this from a negative incentive, right? Clean tax cuts changes it from a negative incentive punishing activity to a positive incentive. We're going to positively incent kind of the outcomes that we want to see. And, and to me, I think that, that was the most important kind of finding. And what we do in the paper is really just kind of go through that logic and go through how, uh, by increasing the technology, we incentive for the technology, we can actually lead to the outcomes we want to see. Well, thank you, Wayne. We are trying to, we only have a short time, so we're moving things along. But if you, Wayne will be around later. And if you want to really walk out with Wayne <laughs> or me, will we'll be around. So, uh, but in any event, ne next I wanted to move, you know, to, uh, to Pasha with ACEEE, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Um, ACEEE is, is, has been around for a while under the leadership of Steve Nadell, uh, and they've, they've been uh, instrumental in, in pushing forward a lot of really good legislation on energy efficiency much of which has been passed under Republican leadership, which is interestingly enough. Uh, and uh, Steve was part of the original charrette at Columbia University, hosted by Rocky Mountain Institute, Grace Richardson Fund, and the Sabin Center, looking into this. And they've stayed with this through the whole process. Uh, Steve was, after the first charrette, a number of different organizations stuck up their hands and said, well, we'll study clean tax cuts for uh, automobile sector, our street took that, and uh, Nature Conservancy took farming and forestry, and we had a, a bunch of others, uh, all kinds of other sectors. But AC Tripoli wanted to do the real estate sector, and they did a they did a great job with that. But after that, they went even further, and they decided to do federal policy and pull all those different sectors together and try to come up with the ideal. Uh, way to introduce the clean tax cut concept into federal legislation. So, Pasha, why don't you tell us a little bit about 
that journey. And what ended up being, of all the clean tax cut uh, uh, you know, mechanisms that had been uh, dreamed up by these eight different charrettes in different sectors, on the equity side, on the debt side, what was the winner? What is the winning mechanism that we went up with and why? So Rod talked about the process, the charrettes. Wayne talked about the economics. I'm going to talk about the politics a little bit. This proposal, what we're talking about, is a tax incentive that addresses private bonds and loans for clean energy assets. Not public bonds. We have mechanisms for that already. But private bonds. As Wayne um, uh, explained, a lot of the mechanisms that are out there right now legally are to uh, capture externalities or, in layman speak, sticks versus carrots. What we're trying to develop now is a set of policies that offers carrots that incentivize investment in clean energy technologies. There are mechanisms out there right now, production tax credits, investment tax credits, et cetera, that are available for large companies and are uh, utilized by banks. And that's been successful. But what we're trying to do is a completely different approach. What we're trying to do with this proposal, and we've got it drafted right now, we've been working with Charles's organization and the, uh, and the broader Clean Capitalist Coalition to draft it. What we're trying to do is have Congress take a look at setting, a, setting up a mechanism whereby your mom and pop investors, your average mutual fund owners can choose to spend their hard earned dollars on bonds or loans that private companies use to build out a clean energy infrastructure. So what are clean energy assets? This is always the conundrum. <laughs> what are you going to uh, specify qualifies as a clean energy asset? And what we've chosen to do is bypass that whole political morass and use what's already defined in the tax code right now and say, take a look at these sections that are already clearly defined, input, input those sections here into this, into this draft legislation. But now let's develop an incentive so that anybody who wants to invest in private bonds and private loans for these assets can do so. Uh, as Rod mentioned, the draft title is the uh, Clean Free Market Act. Of course, uh, none of us here are elected to uh, the Senate or Congress, so we'll see where that goes. We'd like to have a uh, champion uh, in the House or the Senate, and we're going to be pursuing that now that we have uh, draft legislation uh, produced as recently as just a couple weeks ago. But we'll see what it's called eventually. But the idea there is, again, private bonds or loans, not public bonds. That already exists. But what's the key difference in terms of uh, what's the missing ingredient in a public bond that you have in a private bond but you don't have in a public bond? In one word, access. What about leverage? You and – I'm going to have to defer to Wayne on the <laughs> But the – with access, you're talking about a, a, a much bigger market of who can invest. With private activity bonds, some of the criticism, which I'll state gently, is that you have to have government connections to know how to work the system. We're trying to develop a market for a completely different um, pool of potential investors. With respect to leverage, Wayne, I'll, I'll defer to you on that. Yes, you, you get leverage effects. <laughs> so let me let me just uh, before I move on to to Charles, let me just explain that uh, when you are in the you know issuing a government bond, there's no financial leverage because on the other side of of that bond is government, so you're not you don't get any leverage. But in the private market, you have equity on the other side, so you're leveraging up that equity. Capitalists have always used debt cheap debt to make their equity more valuable. You don't, you don't issue more debt, you don't issue more equity because that's expensive. The equity holders want a lot of return. The debt holders in return for uh, certainty on getting their debt paid back will accept a, a lower interest rate, right? So, and we make that, that leverage even steeper by the tax exemption. So this is really great and very powerful leverage. And 
what, what the kind of effect that you get by applying a supply side tax cut directly to financial leverage. Um, you get, you, not only are you pushing down the cost of capital, which means you're going to get cheaper clean energy, cheaper clean uh, uh, cars and clean assets in general, but you're leveraging up the return on equity, which means that you're going to attract equity investors as well as the tax-exempt debt investors. And those equity investors are going to be paying taxes. In fact, in the United States, return on debt is about 4%. Return on equity is about 13.6. So if you think about this, you're giving up tax expense where the re returns are low, and you're taking in tax revenue where the returns are high. So the, the, the tax revenues here, if, if it's a 50-50, you know, clean asset bond, tax-exempt bond mixed to, to equity, you know, that's the, the, about 340 percent more revenue that's being taxed on the equity side than being taxed on the debt side. That's more government revenue than you're giving up in terms of tax expense. And what you're doing is making this a market that's open to everybody because all investors can invest in higher equity returns. Everyone, through mutual funds, globally, pension funds. It doesn't matter your tax status. You're all, everybody's attracted to the, the, the higher returns. So you have two very, very broad kinds of investment vehicles, the tax exempt bonds and the equity returns on it. So you, the, the idea was to not simply use, uh, it, it's, the, the incentive isn't simply tax exemption. The incentive is also the fact that you're u crafting it in a way to break through market barriers to create a bigger market. So the, 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 that got us to this idea of clean free markets and the idea that, hey, when you craft a tax policy, what you really want to also be paying attention to is all the other market barriers that are there too. So we started talking about clean free market policy, which caught the attention, I think, of CRESS and the CRESS Forum, who proposed a new coalition, and why don't you tell us about that part of the journey? Yeah, Charles. thanks, thanks, Rod. And first of all, thank you to all of you here for filling up the room. I think it's a it's a big deal that's to all, participate. <laughs> I think that's great <laughs> to participate in New York Climate Week. What's happening with the United Nations with National Clean Energy Week? Uh, there's a lot happening, and it's it's for me as someone who's worked uh, well over a decade in this space as an advocate for clean energy, it's, it's heartwarming to see all of you here. So my name is Charles Hernick. I'm with an organization called Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions. If all you remember from today is I was the dude who drank a Budweiser beer at the front, I think that that will be fine because it will emphasize a point. I, was, I took an ornithology class, which is the study of birds in college, and my professor said, I'm going to make you guys remember how birds mate. And he used two donuts to show us the example, and I won't go into the details of it. Uh, but needless to say, I never forgot, and I hope that you never forget this, uh, the Budweiser example. So, Rod, I, I appreciate the introduction on, on Clean Capitalist Coalition, which is really a group of, of organizations and a handful of individuals who are sincerely interested in identifying specific knobs that we can turn in policy to achieve emissions reductions fast. Because I think that that's the maybe missing link uh, in a lot of climate change events and conferences that I've gone to. We talk about the problem. There's a lot of concern. But the actions, um, well, it, it seemed, it's a little bit overwhelming. Uh, and so we got together and, and we decided that we could uh, try to establish a brain trust to help rapidly vet ideas uh, and improve them. And so that's where, uh, you know, with the Clean Free Market Act, uh, it came in and it was certainly well developed based on, on sound economic analysis and, and a number of different charrettes where uh, semi-public, you know, input had been provided. Uh, but to then use uh, expertise of a lot of concerned policy experts in the D.C. area and uh, around the country to really put a focus on it and try to provide the right time and attention to that policy. Uh, and it's been fantastic. It's been a good process. And so the Clean Capitalist Coalition uh, exists to, to do that, to rapidly vet policies and then um, create support on the back end. Because what do politicians know if it's not people calling and visiting their offices and telling them that something is a good idea or a bad idea? 
Uh, and so when it comes to clean energy and, and climate, this is one area where we're working actively, and especially with Republicans. My organization works a lot with conservatives and Republicans. Uh, that's our primary focus, is to cre- try to create some liquidity there. So it's been a, a fantastic opportunity because what we're talking about with Clean Free Market Acts, the, the Clean Fleet Free Market Act, is kicking open the door for investment and investors. You don't need to know everything about the tax framework and how it works in the United States. But what I can tell you is that historically, access to capital for renewable energy projects has been somewhat limited. Limited to big banks, limited to big investors. And that's not necessarily a bad thing when you're at the point where you need to get some projects started and get some uh, material out there. But we're at this point, Rod mentioned a tipping point, where everybody wants in on renewables, whether it be communities in in rural Minnesota, uh, whether it be large-scale companies like Anheuser-Busch and Budweiser that take out multi-million dollar ads to promote to beer drinkers that they brew their beer with 100% renewable wind power. Now, that's a big deal. And so if we can tap that market potential, that interest, and create more finance options, that's going to be a big part of it. Uh, the Clean Capitalist Coalition also works on other policy proposals, too. We don't anticipate that there's a single silver bullet. Everybody knows that that's not the case. Uh, so in addition to working on opportunities to increase financing options through bonds and loans for the private sector, we're also working on a voluntary framework that would help raise uh, visibility accountability and transparency for all of the companies that are making proclamations that we're going 100% renewables. Those are These are good things that we want to encourage. But as consumers, we also want to assure that over time, and as we approach 2030 or 2040 or 2050, whatever these timelines are, that folks can be held accountable for those those proclamations so that shareholders aren't uh, being ripped off and that we know that, that folks are, in fact, achieving those goals. And so that we as consumers, if we're going to make a decision at the liquor store, and we're going to decide if we're going to buy Budweiser or something else, uh, that we can make that decision um, with good information and know that there's, uh, there's a robust process of accounting you know, behind that. Now, I don't get paid yet for every Budweiser that's sold. But if I do, I will be very happy. Uh, and I think that that's the kind of attitude that, that we need to have, is that if we can provide customers with good information about what the carbon content is of the products, that they're utilizing, that's a big deal. There are companies like Occidental Petroleum that are focused on sequestering carbon dioxide, so sticking carbon dioxide underground. They're going to get oil and gas out, and they're going to turn it into gasoline that's going to go into gas tanks and it's going to get burned. Mm -hmm. But if what comes out the end of that tailpipe is net zero emissions because they sequestered enough on the front end, well, that's a big deal. And that means that if you're choosing from the gas station on the left or choosing from the gas station on the right, and one of them is zero emissions, and you know that because there's a federal stamp of approval, like you can get USDA Organics or you can get an Energy Star or whatever microwave, um, that could rapidly help us inform the marketplace and empower individuals and consumers. And so these are some of the options. Are these? Is this what's going to get us to where we need to be by 2030 or 2040? It's probably not all we need to do. But it's something that we think that we can do and that we can activate. And we've received a lot of good feedback from members of Congress that these are ideas that we could put forward and move on in the next year or two. Because if you really think that climate change is real and is a problem and something that we need to act on, well, we should act now. Not in 2021, not in 2025, or whatever it is. Uh, and so for me, it's been great to work with with you, Rod, and, and, and Pasha and Wayne, Jeremy and others. Uh, to to really try to vet actionable ideas and, and move those forward. Thank you very much, Charles. I, I want to say also that uh, Crest Forum is hosting National Clean Energy Week this week in Washington, D.C. They can't, they can't call it climate in Washington, so it has to be National <laughs> Clean Energy Week. But um, it's, the, it's going to be a great event. If any of you are in Washington, uh, you should sign up and go. We're going. You know, we'll be talking about some of the other uh, uh, policies that are being put forward by the Clean Capitalist Coalition, uh, Energy Choice Competition, uh, and and a few other ideas as well, which you'll hear. Mm -hmm. But uh, before we shift to the other panel, I just wanted to ask, are there any uh, folks in the room from the energy industry, uh, any phase of it? Um, 
you know, what I wanted to ask for those who are in the energy industry, would tax exempt bonds and loans and bringing down the cost of capital in that way help expand your business, help you finance these projects? Would it help? Any, any, any thoughts? Yes? Ellie Russling from Micro Aero Power. We're based in Rochester, New York. We're actually an early stage company, but we're leveraging IP coming out of $100 million corporate R&D programs and looking to apply that into the clean energy space. Access to capital for these innovations has really been the greatest challenge that we have found. So having a private mechanism to bring that into the marketplace would be spectacular, both for the innovation front and also for the deployment. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Uh, ClearPath Foundation was uh, founded by Jay Faison, uh, a North Carolina uh, entrepreneur who decided to uh, put uh, his substantial fortune at the service of developing conservative, uh, uh, you know, policies that would promote uh, clean energy. And uh, ClearPath, since when did Jay launch that? It was about five years ago? Uh, almost five years ago now. Five years ago. Uh, has, has really carved out a niche for themselves where they're really at the forefront uh, of, of this in Washington, D.C., in terms of pushing forward really interesting new policy ideas that the Republicans uh, on the Hill can, you know, uh, welcome. Uh, and they've done very well with uh, a couple of their uh, ideas uh, that we will we'll talk about in a second. Um, I also, we also have Michael Meeling here from, who is the Deputy Director of MIT CEPR, the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research, uh, which has been around for quite a long time uh, and done a, a lot of great research up at MIT into, well, energy and environmental policy research. One of the things they do very well, okay, is that they, they, they can accelerate a profitable uh, technology that's proven. Uh, you know, and you, you can get it from the point where it's reached profitability to really scale it up uh, phenomenally well. They can build clean, free markets and maybe even build them across borders if you include tax reciprocity across borders uh, in that policy mix. But they, they, they can also spur innovation uh, in developed technologies, the kind of incremental in, in, innovation that makes those technologies better. But one of the things that they're not particularly good at is early stage innovation. Uh, because there's very few people who want to loan money to something that's unproven, that doesn't have a track record of either you know, it, it's, uh, you know, of business success. Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, ClearPath has focused on is the idea of innovation, of, of accelerating innovation and looking at early stage. And uh, first of all, why, Jeremy, why don't you introduce us to some of uh, ClearPath's recommendations in a nutshell on, on energy innovation and, and uh, then we'll go on to talk about the work that we're going to think of doing together next week. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Rod, for, for having me here sure. today and uh, thank everyone for, for being here. Can I reiterate to Charles, we know it's, it's a climate week here in, in New York and, and there's a lot of demand on your time, so um, uh, warm to see everyone here, a packed room and appreciate everybody's interest. Uh, as Rod mentioned, my name is Jeremy Harrell, I'm with ClearPath and and uh, really, our whole thesis is is much to uh, Wayne's uh, earlier point. Uh, a lot of clean energy and climate policy has been focused about a negative incentive, carbon tax, things that um, make disproportionately things uh, cheaper or more expensive so that clean is cheaper. Our thesis is we need to make clean energy cheaper globally so that it becomes the more attractive commercial option moving forward. And so we work to advance uh, policies kind of across the policy spectrum aimed at making clean energy cheaper so that um, and, and doing so with, with limited government. We believe there is a role for government in the energy sector as a whole here in the U.S. Like we, energy markets are, are very heavily regulated, right? However, it's limited, limited. We're, we're not going to, to solve this massive global climate problem by regulating, regulating our way out of it. Um, it's just unrealistic on how how we, how we move forward on this challenge. And so everything that we kind of work on in, in, in Washington is one to try to br bring limited government ideals that help make clean energy cheaper. So as we look at that, um, one of the central struggles that we, we identify is, um, you know, our focus is how do we reach big emissions reductions cheaply, quickly, and affordably for the consumer. 
And and one of the key kind of takeaways for us on that perspective is we don't have the technologies we need now. Um, we have very good clean energy technologies out there, and we need to, to rapidly accelerate them. But we also need to fill a gap in the market of how do we bring these new technologies to the to the marketplace. Um, the way our electricity markets are structured, there's no incentive for electric utilities to take a risk and build something new. Um, they're more likely to just invent to to invest and, and build the lowest cops, cost options. And so, how do we try to fill that gap? And that's really where we got to um, what we're calling the energy sector innovation credit. And, and long story short, it's, a, it's a, a tax incentive put in place to try to facilitate those early deployments of technologies. Um, and it's different from kind of the existing tax code, some of the, the, the ITCs, PTCs that the Pasha mentioned earlier, and that it, it tries to envision performance rather than uh, technology specific. Um, and drive investment to those new technologies. So these these technologies, like uh, someone mentioned earlier, who are struggling to get out of the lab and, and prove themselves commercialized can. You get the most robust incentive uh, early on when you're you're showing that you can be commercialized, and then the incentive wanes off um, as as the the technology shows it's commercially viable, or it goes away when you show that uh, you can't survive without subsidies. Um, and that's just one piece of the bigger puzzle, right? We need to find a way to bring new clean energy technologies to the market, and then some the other things we, policies we've been talking about is how do we rapidly deploy the clean energy we have? Because again, you know, here in 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 uh, New York Climate Week, uh, we're focused on how we reduce emissions quickly and affordably, and we need all the tools in our tool be belt to make that happen. One of the things that uh, strikes me as particularly interesting about this ESIC or the uh, Energy Sector Innovation Credit is that. It really uh, it gets away from a lot of the flaws in traditional tax credit subsidies. A lot of you know the ITC and the PTC are focused on very particular technologies. They're not technology neutral, and they uh, also reward things like production or investment as opposed to as uh, you know business success. The thing that I see about the the ESIC is that it is a tr transitional credit. It, it, it's really almost on its way to being a clean tax cut in the sense that it is market mimicking. It mimics a couple of features of the market that are very important, technology neutrality and the reward for, for revenue generation. The market rewards that. ESICs reward that. So it tries to be like the market. Um, I think, you know, it, you know it, these are uh, transitional tools that, you know, they still have some features of tax credits that I don't particularly like, you know, like you have to you go to very wealthy people to attract uh, investment to them. So it, they, they have a market constricting effect. So one of the things that I, I asked, uh, you know, Jeremy about is, you know, could we maybe get together and think about a uh, another charrette to look at clean free market and, and uh, uh, innovate, you know, uh, uh, proposals, clean tax cut, and clean free market policies for energy innovation. And that's happening next week in Washington, D.C. And we'll be looking at a variety of really interesting ideas, uh, you know, that, that look at this. Because, you know, you would think that the clean tax cut ideas have, have focused on profits. But you can also use the expectation of profits for these pre-profitable companies. Um, one of the my one proposal that we uh, we've uh, floated is the idea that um, targeting a particular bottleneck for innovation is that the first five commercial scale plants of a new technology uh, are almost impossible to build. You can have all your ducks in a row, your demonstration projects prove that you're a zero emission uh, technology but the venture capitalists won't touch it because you haven't done it already. So it's a, a catch-22 situation. The, the, it makes it hard to finance. The valley of death, the distance between startup and profitability is too long. The startup is exposed to all kinds of risk. Too difficult. How do you shorten that valley of death? Well, one potential way is to take those first five, perhaps, and make those completely tax exempt just for five, right? So no business taxes, no capital gains taxes. You increase the back end reward and you change the risk reward ratio. The reward for the investors is much higher, but just on the first five. So the federal tax expense is not out through the roof. It's very limited, but you're incenting this. 
So we're looking at ideas like that, but we have to be careful because you don't want to disincentivize other kinds of innovation. One, I mean, one of the th key uh, things that we want to point out is that there are many, many innovations that end up being energy innovations or environmental innovations, but nobody knew that. Uh, Julian was telling me the other day, well, you look at all the technologies that go into a computer and now you don't have to you know, print things out on paper because you can just send the document electronically and we don't have to cut down all those trees, right? But nobody knew that all those technologies were gonna have an environmental impact. So the, the question that we're gonna be looking at is, can we incent clean energy innovation while not disincenting you know, uh, technologies that, you know, might have an impact that we don't want to disincent. So, you know, perhaps, you know, uh, and I, my feeling right now is, and we're going to test this on uh, you know, October 1, is that if you deploy them in, a, in an environment, a low tax, low capital gains tax environment where you're already generally spurring innovation across your economy, which I think we're trying to do in this economy right now, then a mar you know, having a very low tax rate on clean, what looks like a winner for clean in innovation that's, that hits the, the, the clear metrics, uh, you know, might be something where you're achieving your desired result without having a negative incentive on other kinds of innovation. But let me turn to Michael because this charrette on innovation is leading into a larger work uh, that uh, MIT CEPR is doing. Thanks, Rod. Um, and also, thank you for inviting me. It's a privilege to be here. I think it's testament to the convening power of the coalition and not least your efforts to bring people together that we have a packed room in such a busy week here, and also especially to have many new faces in the room, which, which um, I'm very happy to see. Um, so, yes, so I ha I've had sort of a long path working on carbon pricing in policy consulting and policy advisory work and in research for about 20 years. Um, and anybody who works on instrument choice in environmental economics and so on is familiar with the literature and pretty much the mantra that a price-based, a Pigouvian approach or a Cosian approach um, to, to dealing with these externalities is sort of the, the first best policy in the theoretical paradigm that dominates economics currently. When you look outside in, in, in the real world, the empirical evidence, at least gives you pause. You start seeing that some things don't seem to work out as they should. In theory, certainly you have things like behavioral irrationalities. Um, increasingly in the theory, even we acknowledge, and I think this was mentioned before as well, that there are other market failures, positive externalities, for instance, innovation being a good example, but a number of other market failures that justify thinking about alternative instruments. Um, the elasticity is simply, if you look at the transport sector, carbon price just simply does not have the traction there that you would see, for instance, in the power sector. Um, increasingly, research is showing that there are many things that sort of the theoretical, the simple theory of carbon pricing may not um, bear out in practice. And I think it's, it's important for us to acknowledge that because we're investing a lot of political and financial capital in advancing this particular policy instrument simply because it's been acknowledged or proposed as being sort of the preferable, the most cost, in a static cost-benefit perspective, the most efficient instrument. So that to me is sort of just, a, it spells caution. We have to be careful. And there's something that researchers don't like to think about, especially theoretical economists, for instance, and that's simply also the politics of these instruments. It doesn't matter whether, even if it were the most cost-effective in a cost-benefit perspective instrument, if we cannot get it off the ground time and again in different jurisdictions, we're losing valuable time. So that alone sort of spells, it dictates literally, that we have to think about other instruments. So I don't want to bash carbon pricing. I absolutely think it has an important role to play, but I think there's already a process ongoing in the literature and in the research community to rethink sort of what the appropriate role is of carbon pricing. Still, we've had a century of talking about price-based approaches to internalizing externalities and correcting the market failures that underlie environmental pollution. We've had hundreds, if not thousands, of studies on carbon pricing many tens of thousands studies on Pigouvian pricing. More generally, there's a huge corpus of research, even though it's evolving and giving us new insights. On these new policy ideas that you've been developing and, and, and proposing and that many coalition members have taken up and are trying to advance, there's much, much less. There's practically, virtually very little research. And Wayne's paper that he presented today is one of the few sort of papers that really targets that. 
So to me, in the spirit of innovation, you know, we have to kickstart that research also to understand better what the trade-offs are, what the potentials are, what the costs are, and to see really where can we deploy these policies effectively. Um, and so, as you mentioned, one of the things that we're trying to get off the ground, but we're still, we're still short some of the support we need to really move forward with it, is a conference that really tries to get the research quickly started on this topic area. And how better to do that than to define the sort of themes that we think are critical in a inclusive and a charrette format, just as the, as the innovation charrette next week, um, but then issue a call for papers and get, you know, we don't even know yet who the people will be that are researching relevant questions that bring methodologies and disciplinary perspectives to this topic, incentivize them to write something and come and present at a conference, hopefully, in the first half of next year. Um, so we're still fundraising for that, but if we can get this off the ground, I really think it will uh, noteworthy, I mean, really relevantly or, or, or substantially um, advance the understanding of these clean free market policies that, that we've been discussing today. Thank you very much, Michael. Oh, I want to move on from this innovation work we're doing to talk about more about uh, the clean free markets and, and what clean free markets might look like. Uh, you know, Innovating American technology isn't going to do us any good uh, if the markets are closed, if they are uncompetitive and they don't let in new technologies. So what we're going to be talking about next is, you know, opening up markets and other ways of using clean free markets to advance conservation as well. Uh, because this is m more than just about energy as well. So thank you very much, gentlemen. And if I I want to welcome up Guillermo Peña Panting, the founder of Elutra in Honduras, and also a Julian Morris, uh, who is a senior fellow with the Reason Foundation. I met Guillermo, uh, you know, we're, we're both uh, uh, Grace Richardson Fund and uh, Elutra are both members of the Atlas Network. And Atlas is a very interesting network of, of free market think tanks. There are 500 free market think tanks around the world that are part of Atlas, maybe just a little bit shy of that, maybe 486 or something like that. But uh, uh, we met at a conference in uh, the Dominican Republic uh, where we were talking about clean free market policies and the opportunities for those in Latin America. And uh, Guillermo uh, came uh, to the table with a few very interesting ideas. Uh, Guillermo uh, uh, is the, uh, not only the founder of Elutra, uh, because of his suggestions on energy uh, market reform in Honduras, uh, you know, he's been elected to the board and is now the vice president of the electrical system operator in Honduras. In Honduras, as, as Guillermo will tell you, um, you know, as in many, many countries around the world, the situation is, is not good. I mean, you, you have, in many of these countries, uh, you know, either from the left or the right, they've been dominated by political cronies. Uh, the uh, grids are too small to really balance renewables. They're very dirty, very expensive. They take a lot of government subsidies. They add to the government debt, and they deliver rolling blackouts. So when you're trying to, you know, create economic development and build a new factory, or new, or new real estate development or a new housing complex, you can't do it because there's no power to hook it up to. And if there's no power to hook it up to, there's no jobs from it. So you, you have an immediate, this is a critical path barrier to economic development, one of which is driving the migration crisis we're seeing uh, in the United States, in Europe. Uh, you know, you're seeing you know, the, the, the rise of black markets uh, you know, to because people can't make money in the in the uh, regular market, uh, and many other problems that uh, come along with this. But in any event, uh, Guillermo, why don't you tell them a little bit about your, uh, you know, basic proposal for what you are trying to accomplish? Okay. Well, thanks, Rod. It's uh, it's great to be here. Um, so I'll start by uh, like climate doesn't respect borders, and yeah, the conversation has been usually done around. Um, you know, U.S. climate investment and, and 
ways to, to, to reduce the cost of capital here for these projects. But um, in our case, we it, it changes quite a bit because when you have high cost of power, then there's an attractiveness to invest when there's large margins or there's a lot of inefficiencies. By improving those inefficiencies, now the cost becomes a something else. The cost is um, co contract protection or political instability, which adds a different level to, to, to the conversation. So um, we see the energy problem in Honduras um, as mainly as originally as a, as a grid problem, you can you can bring all the green energy you want and and uh, or stable sources of power, whatever it is you want to bring in. But if you can't move it, it doesn't do anything. Um, and and it's worse when someone has to pay for those contracts that were approved in Congress because the the generators have a contract, they're putting it in, but the system has 25, 30% losses in the grid, someone pays for that lost power. So obviously that destabilizes the, financial, the, the energy system as a whole. So we, um, I usually stay on the side of investment. And so I, I, I come into this system operator role from, from working with companies, from helping companies establish operations in Honduras. And uh, what, we, what we usually look in or when anyone's looking for a new market, there's basically three main drivers that an investor looks at. And uh, one's the cost of capital, which has been spoken about. Uh, another is the cost of labor, which has been one of the ways that Honduras has tried to bring in investment for the last 30 years as you know, like the, the textile industries and some of the manufacturing industries. And the third one is the cost of power. Um, there's a lot of projects that can't get going if you don't have stable, reliable, abundant energy at, at the right price. So when we, there, there's a development pro problem if you're trying to keep the cost, if, if your attraction becomes the cost of labor, because you're not increasing the quality of life that easily. So what you want to do is reduce the cost of power, reduce the cost of capital, and allow for economic growth to increase income in family houses. At the end of the day, if people leave, is be, the only way to get people to stay is, is if there's a reason to stay. And the reason, I think there's been a wrong message that's been portrayed about the Honduran, and not only Honduran, but Guatemala and El Salvador migrant crisis, that it's a job problem. It's not a job problem. It's a, it's a loss of hope of upward social mobility. Uh, it's, it's the loss of, I will, I can't, if I do things right, I can be better than my parents. Uh, where it's, it's, a, it's a very simple process, um, but it's hard to grasp of where you get in. When the way we see it is, let's start with energy. Energy is can be your driver factor for this. So um, we've seen the problems with doing high increases in, in, in clean energy. Uh, there was there was a drive, um, partially like peer pressured by Costa Rica to to, uh, to push for for ener for clean energy projects. And we had this, you know, about 30, 40% of, of the capacity grew with solar and wind power that came in, but the grid wasn't upgraded. So if you can't upgrade the grid, and if you don't have stable sources around these new, this new um, with the solar and the wind farms, whenever the sun goes down or the wind dies, then you have 400, 500 megawatts going out in a single place, knocking a, a, the, the city's grid out. Uh, so there's, you can't, think about generation without thinking about transmission and distribution. Uh, so this whole system has to be tied together and that's where opening the market comes in. Um, the, Honduras is a very small economy. The energy grid is small, but when we, we are, there's already a treaty and, a, and, a, and an operating transmission line that ties in from Guatemala to Mexico, but it operates from Guatemala to Panama with the system operators talking to each other, but it's a fragile system. It's usually a linear system, it's not a mesh. And uh, two weeks ago, uh, two Fridays ago, uh, we had a power line, a transmission line go out in Honduras that knocked out, made a national blackout for Honduras and Nicaragua, half of El Salvador, and, and the problem caused, now someone has to pay for that system, um, and it's because it's a linear system. It's a single point of failure. So that, it, the problem there was we're trying to also break a state monopoly that owns the transmission line, owns distribution lines, um, 
and owns the retail markets. And if you're a generator, you have to sell to the state power company. Luckily, we've, we're done with the regulation process. And we're now setting up, since June, the, the system operator was created. And uh, because, I guess, the work that we have done at, at Fundación Eleutera, I got called in to representing to the board. There's five members, and I represent consumers. So now we're trying to, my angle is, we need to create a lower cost po lowest cost possible for power, um, have reliable power, and have the highest quality power. And that's how we create bringing down the cost of power without the, without the politicians really moving the, the price down, which is a tendency in Latin America to control prices. To summarize it, what you're proposing is energy choice competition, energy choice retail directly. and wholesale competition with an international cross-border component of a building mesh, out that grid internationally line. in Central America. Correct. So uh, that, that, correct. that is a, to me, that's a revolutionary kind of great idea because it combines energy. We have a lot of people advocating for energy choice competition in the Clean Capitalist Coalition. The Energy Choice Coalition is part of us, uh, advanced energy economy, and uh, you know also uh, the, the uh, Earth Stewardship Alliance. And you know they, they all have the same basic idea that you need to fence in the monopoly and introduce choice, and both at the retail and the wholesale level. And if you do that, especially in this new environment where uh, clean technologies are uh, you're reducing their costs uh, and becoming more competitive and profitable, you'll have greater uh, renewable energy, clean energy participation in the market. And that seems to be bearing out in places like Texas that has the highest uh, wind energy uh, participation in places like Chile as well that have a very uh, competitive markets. So getting that uh, choice into the market is, is, a, is a key area, and it's going to be key also for allowing new innovations into those markets that drive them cleaner as well. Uh, and that basically there, so I, think, I think you're right. And what, we, what we're trying to now is from the system operator role is send the right messages so that private investment can look into this and say, OK, so it's good. Now I don't have to say, sell to a state monopoly contracts can be better respected and send the right signals to investment to grow because since the margin or the cost and the inefficiencies are so high, there is a business opportunity there and it's really a contract protection and rule of law problem that we have to fix now, which I think by, uh, but we don't have to invent anything. It's already been invented. There's best practices all over. So bringing, bringing these in, yes, that will allow for clean energy systems um, to, 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 prosper without having to have um, the disturbances in the market that have, that have been the process today, uh, which is getting preferential treatment into the grid with very high cost contracts, which that doesn't, hasn't helped uh, up until today uh, to, to have a lower cost energy, which is what we need for the country. So this idea uh, of energy choice competition within countries, and maybe where it makes sense crossing borders to, is pretty revolutionary. And think about the opportunity for not only building the local economies, because you're relieving that problem of the energy shortages, so you're able to develop, but also the, the uh, opportunity for American companies. We thought that maybe there might be some sort of opportunity with COP25 coming up for an international proposal about this. We floated this by uh, Julian, and he said, well, what we were thinking of was not quite the right way, but he, Julian had a really great suggestion for us. And Julian, why don't you tell us a little bit about what that is, and then we'll move on to your conservation uh, idea. Sure. I mean, we can just outline. So, so the, the idea is to um, come up with a, a declaration that would be signed by members of civil society, and I could I could say that that's a broad group. It includes nonprofits, but it could also improve, in, include trade associations and, 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 and companies. And this declaration would say something along the lines of, um, we support um, the removal of um, unnecessary barriers to uh, competition and choice in the energy sector in order to achieve um, improvements in efficiency, innovation, and, and, and benefits to uh, consumers and the environment. Some, you know, I'm just, I'm literally just making that up on the spur of the moment. But <laughs> some kind of declaration of that, of that, of that nature, um, which 
would be a sort of statement of purpose. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be just a, a, a thing that we, we throw out there. It would be something that w w which would guide future activities, but guide future lobbying efforts in countries around the world to advance to advance this agenda. But we'd put that out as a strong message um, in advance of, of COP25, making clear that this is a very very important mechanism um, for ensuring that clean technologies are developed. Um, and that the kind of broader objective of addressing climate change is achieved in the most cost-effective manner um, and, and without harming um, the, the many poorer people around the world who otherwise might be um, adversely affected by some of, some, some of the many policies that have been proposed otherwise. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that it goes beyond being a question of what is, you know, beneficial economically and what is beneficial environmentally because it, I think that there's a question of, shouldn't there be a right for people to choose what kind of safe, affordable, reliable energy they buy or sell or produce? Shouldn't they have a right to energy choice freedom? So I, I think that, you know, whether we want to go there or not, I don't know, but, you know, we, we can debate the pros and cons of that, but, you know, trammel. You know, it seems to me that we might have an opportunity here to bring people from the freedom movement together with people from the environmental movement uh, to in such a, a declaration. And I think that, you know, between the Clean Capitalist Coalition and the Clean Capitalist Leadership Council might be... Yeah, come on up. Hey, <laughs> grab a chair. This is my fellow co-chair, Trammell Crow, the founder of EarthX. Let's give him a Hello. round. Thank you. What, 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 what Trammell has done for building the, 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 this movement is quite extraordinary uh, with, with EarthX. But Trammell, uh, you know, Julian, you have an idea about where this declaration should be launched and when. And ex explain that to the audience and let's see what Trammell thinks. Well, so, so one idea was to launch it um, in the week of November the 5th. Um, and the reason for that, um, Let's and, go and, for and, and, and do it in, in New York, because this is the center of the world's media, um, like it or love. And um, the reason for doing it that week is that, that, uh, that during that week, the Atlas Foundation is holding its Liberty Forum, which means that there'll be you know, upwards of 80 uh, groups from around the world represented here. So you've got a built-in uh, n number of groups from, from different countries many of whom I, would, I suspect would be interested in signing on to something like that. I don't think it'd be a problem to do it on Guy Fawkes Day. No, I, I, I mean, also, there's that sort of explosive <laughs> element to, uh, <laughs> to doing it on Guy Fawkes Day. <laughs> From hill to hill. <laughs> and uh, Rod had said maybe November 6th, That's the which is the Liberty International Day. Day for the Prevention of the Exploitation of the Environment Through Armed Conflict and Terrorism. And my birthday. <laughs> And it'd be okay to do it then, too. We could do it. Uh -huh. yeah, no, that, uh -huh. During that week is, it was, uh -huh. was the pitch. But, but yeah. <laughs> Trammell, do you think that, uh, I mean, I think that Guillermo and uh, Julian and I can work to bring in some of these 500 free market think tanks from around the world. Energy choice competition is easy for conservatives. And I think it's the area where it's most easy for environmentalists and conservatives to meet because of the benefits. Do you think you can help us bring in the environmentalists well, the, the, to the this people, table? The, the environmentalists and the, uh, what we call the Green Republicans, uh, uh, CREST, Conservatives for Responsible Environmental Solutions. Uh, <laughs> that guy over there, yes. Uh, and uh, a, a Clear Path, and the, these various groups, and also from Dallas. Uh -huh. Uh, and we can help bring those on the environmental groups. Yeah. We could help there. Maybe that's where you might need more of the help. And the more conservative environmental groups, not the Sierra Club and the uh, uh, Nature Conservancy and so forth. And then those that are already up here in New York, yeah, including this, some of these foundations. And some of the CEOs of major companies, the Apples, the Walmarts, the Siemens. the To bring them here? Well, to bring them to... Well, maybe, uh, maybe we could just find some that are here. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. But we'll... Uh, uh, but uh, if I may, wait, by way of introduction, <laughs> if I could explain the context in which I'm talking, what we have in Dallas is an environmental event, uh, what, what we've 
always have called an environmental event on April 22nd or thereabouts because that's Earth Day. And for nine years, we've built this up with Expo and conference and speakers and hackathon and ride and drive and things for the public and, and professional. And it is very unusual, first of all, because there aren't Earth Day events of any size or consequence, and there aren't public uh, environmental events of any meaning, and there aren't any Earth Day events besides rock and roll concerts and street parties with a lot of trash. So we've done something very different, and this last year we had 177,000 people, 420 speakers, 13 conferences, and so forth. We haven't had, we haven't followed any rule book, so we've done, we've broken all the rules, and I think that's why it has worked. We've had we have Ocean Conference, Smart City Conference, Legal, a simple, uh, Island Resilience Conference with uh, ambassadors from small nations, island nations. Trammell, and, we're going to have you on the next panel oh, to talk about I all, all that. So, what, what I wanted right, to get your it's, feedback it's on was from, this particular from this, from this context. But we're we're going to get you that we have environmental groups also of a, a conservative nature, uh, uh, w which we've had to do in order to to bring in the leadership of the Texas community. Well, thank you. We're going to delve more into that with uh, our next panel. But before we do, you mentioned environmental. And, you know, Julian has done work with the Reason Foundation on a broader range of environmental issues than just energy. And, you know, one of the... Um, one of the pre-exist, you know, the, the precedents, uh, the successful precedents for clean tax cuts is something that I want to point out, but by way of pointing out a certain conundrum. In the United States, since 1987, we've regrown over 33 million acres of U.S. forests. Now, there's some debate about what that number is. It might be a little larger than that. but. That stands in sharp contrast to the hundreds of millions of acres of forests, of rainforests that have been lost uh, in the rest of the world. Julian, do you have any idea what the difference is? What's the policy difference? Why is America regrowing, the United States regrowing its forest, and much of the rest of the world is losing theirs? Uh, it's complicated, but I mean, one of the underlying uh, differences. I mean, let's, do, let's make a, a cartoon picture here. The cartoon, which I think is you know, broadly accurate, is uh, that in the United States and in Europe and in Australia and other parts of the world um, that are relatively developed, you have two things. You have strong property rights that are clearly defined, readily enforceable, and readily transferable. Those strong property rights, which are readily enforceable and easily transferable, as well as uh, the rule of law, good freedom of contract and so on, have led to economic development. Um, uh, they've also enabled people and incentivized people to invest in, in conservation, um, the combination of those things. So the ability to, to protect one's land um, in, incentivizes one to, to invest in improvements in agricultural productivity or um, it, it, you know, as, as development takes place and, and pressure on the land is reduced, to, to invest in, in, in conservation. And, uh, and that, that latter occurs more when you're, when you're richer. So, those are, so there's two sort of intertwining factors that I think are really important to bear in mind. Um, in many parts of the world that are less developed, an underlying reason for the, the lack of development is the, the lack of clearly defined, readily enforceable, and readily transferable property rights, um, which undermines the ability and incentive to invest in development of agriculture, uh, efficient agriculture, um, and, and, and it undermines development per se, which means that there's less incentive to invest in, in conservation. There's some interesting changes that have been taking place over the past few years. So, for example, in Brazil, there's been um, a, a move towards um, a stronger protection of private property in some parts of Brazil, uh, while um, in some parts of the Amazonia basin. Um, meanwhile, uh, the federal government uh, has uh, continued to notionally control development. A study published a couple of years ago showed that the, uh, the uh, amount of, uh, of, uh, of deforestation in the government, the federally controlled area, was uh, 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 
about 20% more than the amount in the areas that were subject to private uh, control. Um, and, and it actually got, gets worse over time. So the, the, the difference increases over, over, over time in proportional terms. Although it has to be said that deforestation in Brazil has been declining. <laughs> Contrary to, uh, you know, past month we've, hear, we've heard story after story of burning rainforests. So actually, if you look at the data, um, the, the amount of deforestation has been declining, and in part because the country's been growing. Um, people have been investing more in conservation than they have been in, in, in slash and burn agriculture. Um, so things are not nearly as bad in some senses than they, than they seem. Uh, but this, the stark difference, uh, though, uh, in, between the United States and, and countries which have experienced rapid deforestation um, is a lot to do with uh, uh, private protection of, 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 of property. And you, you would probably note um, that in the US over the course of the past few years, an additional incentive has come uh, from uh, the tax deductibility of, 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 of conservation easements. I'm sure that's, that's, had, that's contributed to, uh, to conservation. Um, but I think mostly it's about property rights and the growth that comes along with, uh, with a free market economy, enabling people to invest in conservation and want to invest in conservation. I mean, Ted Turner's 100 million acres, I mean, it's, it's you know, well, <laughs> that wasn't well, driven by conservation yeah. easements, right? The conservation easements are very uh, interesting instruments because this is an example, like clean tax cuts, of the idea of if you want more of something, tax it less. So this is an idea that initially had uh, quite a lot of Republican leadership behind it. Uh, these ideas, the conservation easement tax d uh, deductions, one of the, some of the first examples of this were passed into law under Governor Ronald Reagan in California. Uh, federally, they were passed into law by uh, uh, Gerald Ford. Uh, and th I think that they have had a, a huge uh, success. If you look at the, those, those laws were made a little bit stronger and better, and under, under, under the Reagan administration, they really kicked in. And you've seen this tremendous regrowth in the U.S. force since the 1980s. If you want to think about climate policy, this is perhaps the most powerful climate policy that the United States has ever put into effect. If you think about the carbon sequestration potential of 33 million acres of forests, uh, you know, th that's huge, but it was never intended to be a climate policy. It was just a conservation policy. So these uh, instruments have probably been overdone in some cases in some states, uh, but the, the, generally the concept is, is pretty good. And one of the things that I'd like to at some day uh, look into, and maybe with some of our new Latin American partners, is there a way using private property rights, rule of law, and some tax incentives, and maybe even a few clean tax cuts, can we, can we reverse the deforestation uh, that's gone on so that we have a, the lungs of the planet are kept healthy uh, is an idea that I'd want to say. I'd like to give you guys just an opportunity for some quick questions. Yes, sir. So uh, I've worked in wind and solar for many years. I was with Vestas Wind Systems. I, I'm on the board of a solar company. So I'm, I'm in the industry. And uh, I love the idea about deregulation. And if you look not only about countries, but also within the United States, we began that process of deregulation back in the 90s. We went about halfway, right? So there's about half the United States that's not deregulated. And where are we building nuclear? And where are we building coal? And where are we not building solar? It's all those places, right? So they're in the southeast, the northwest. I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? So you used ERCOT as the example, fantastic example. Very red state, very conservative state, built more wind and solar than anybody else. So to me, you know, it's all very nice to say, you know, help us get cheaper, help us get lower cost of capital. But actually, the most important thing is get us the opportunity to compete mm -hmm. like we have in Texas. Give us that in Georgia and Alabama and the Northwest, and we'll win. Right. But that's what we need. Is there any talk about that, you know, sort of restarting the effort to deregulate those other markets? There are th three members of the, of the uh, coalition that their entire focus is on energy choice competition and opening up state markets, and another several that are, that's part of what they do. Uh, so uh, uh, like the Conservative Energy Network uh, focuses on that as well. So Reason's part of a coalition of free market groups and environmental groups that is pushing for exactly that um, yeah. in very specific states. So you're not trying to tackle the whole of the US, you're going to the states where you're gonna get most leverage. 
but yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and believe me, it's always nice to have reason on your side. <laughs> so uh, so uh, another question uh, from Michael, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, and I, I commend all efforts to look at policy changes and policy reforms that lead to, to clean markets. But despite my accent, I'm Australian, and, and we've, rolled, we've rolled five prime ministers over climate policy in the last 12 years. <laughs> Um, so if you think it's difficult getting things done here, try coming to our country. So when we look at this problem on a macro scale, roughly there's a low hundreds of, of billions of dollars being invested in decarbonizing the global energy system. There's still considerably more money going investing on the other side. So a matter of fact, it's probably tw our estimates is about 20 times that. Right? So you know you're talking about clean free market policy, but there's a hundred trillion dollar debt market, right? And so. What, what, what do markets do? Well, uh, they identify, quantify, and price risk, right? Mm -hmm. And so in Australia, we're seeing our banks, our five major banks, recognize uh, climate risk like any other business risk, right? And so if you're, if you're going to build uh, or upgrade an airport in Australia, and you're going to dramatically improve its carbon performance, the banks are, our banks are going to lower that by 50 basis points. So the question we ask is, if we have to go from hundreds of billions to, to single trillions, Right, to drive that kind of change. That's the scale that we need. What are the best levers to pull? Are, and of course, there are policy levers to pull, and everything that's been discussed today, I think, are, are, are wonderful. But we've got roughly a decade, and we've got this big order of magnitude problem. Why aren't we working towards allowing the market to do what it does best, right? Identify, quantify, and price risk. Because if it does that, right, and we can accelerate that, and banks treat that as any other risk, they'll discount that, and significantly more capital will flow in that direction. In 67 countries, utility-scale solar and wind are the cheapest forms of electricity, including your country and my country, right? So the market is deli has delivered an extraordinary solution in almost the total absence of any, any policy intervention, right? Let me thank uh, Julian and Guillermo. Thank you very much. Let me just say it real quickly. Uh, we have created something in the heart of the nation. Dallas, Texas, in the bastion of conservatism, which is the largest environmental event in the world. Exhibitors, conferences, leaders, politicians, general public, corporations, environmental groups, we are boycotted by Sierra Club. That's how conservative this is. This is the most conservative environmental event in the world where hunters and fishers can talk about wildlife conservation, where we can have a conference on Oil, responsible oil and gas. We do not call it Earth X frack. Uh, I want to. And I, I urge you to come to this because we have created this and it now it's, we've, it's outgrown Dallas. It needs to have the rest of the nation. It needs to have fiscal conservatives. It needs to have the type of political thought that, that Rod has brought to it. Rod has had a sustainable salon there and, and carried on very wonderful conversations, mixing all types of environmental professionals, uh, politicians, and general public. The reason it's, it's, I'm so fervent about this is not only because time's a wasting, but next year is April 22, 2020, is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And if we don't make it happen then, It'll never happen. So April 22 to 26, 2020, Dallas, Texas. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, Tramway, you've done a wonderful job. Uh, EarthX.org. Visit the website. You're all invited. You can see the eCapital Summit Oceans Conference workshops, expos about new technology and lots of things being brought to market. It's a tremendous multi-day event and uh, you're all welcome to attend. There are many ways that we can all get involved. This, we're thrilled that you've been able to participate in ours and we encourage you to continue. Please look at our website. Uh, we're gonna shorten it, but for now, it's still the Clean Capitalist Leadership Council.org. We'll be posting our video and we have policy briefs there. We welcome all of you to review our materials and we uh, invite you to respond for your comment and participation. Thank you again for coming, uh, kicking off Climate Week 2019.